craft beer o'clock on Real Ale Craft Beer. We're making our way to Green King Brewery on the train, uh, all the way from more or less west, west of the UK, all the way to the east of the UK. Uh, really looking forward to my trip there, gonna drink some awesome beers. Let's get in there, let's get going. King. Hey Ross. How are you doing? How you doing? Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. So Bury St Edmunds. Yeah. Lovely Warm. place, yeah? Warm. How long does it take you? What time you set off this morning? Six o'clock this morning. Set off, it's okay. It's a long commute. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a beer. Yeah. <laughs> shaped building with the flints and the mortar. Right. That little corner site there was the first brewery. That's Benjamin King's brewery, the original brewery. Benjamin Green, sorry. Yes, remember, yeah. ben Green and King were not contemporaneous. At that stage. Green first, King later. So right. that was Benjamin's brewery. Right. Uh, and also Benjamin, he went from being a penniless but, but, but thrusting young man within a few years he then had built for his family number six Westgate across the road there, that big Georgian pile. Yeah. Because by that stage he had a wife and 13 children. Uh, in 15 years his wife did good service and produced him 15 children. So that was, that's, that's but remember there was no, no TV, no internet, no, no blogging, nothing like that back then. I know you're one of those. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of beer, so that yeah. was all brutal. As well as the house, he paid for a new theatre in Bury. So there was oh, an existing many. Wilkins yep. to build that theatre and build the house. And that's for the people of the town, the yes. people of Bury St Edmunds. Yeah, and he made that generous offer to say, look, I'm a man of substance. I have arrived in Bury St Edmunds. I would like your respect. That's lovely. But actually they didn't give him much respect because he wasn't the most likable of individuals, I would suggest. Okay. He was very hard-nosed and business-like and the local people never really warmed to him. Okay. Which is why after 36 years he gave it a good shot and after that time he went to London and passed the business to Edward, who was a much nicer guy. Lovely. So that's the Green Brewery, and then if you turn around, the building there with the cream facing and the Green King sign, yeah. that was that was Mr. King's Brewery. That was the King's Brewery. So that was not that was 1867. Okay. And 
said already he was uh, uh, he joined the malting family by marrying into the family which is just around 100 yards that way right. and he quickly realized that actually uh, instead of just making the malt why not go the whole hog and make some beer so he established a brewery there so you had king there and green there and they continued in companionable um, competition for 20 years. And this is an add-on? This is something... Right, so, okay, after the merger, 1887, none of this existed in 1887. Green and King went off into the sunset, the next generation took over. 50 years passed before the new brew house was built. And this was built in the 1930s. You can see these 30s decor. This is just Wonderful. classic Wonderful. Art Deco yeah. 30s uh, um, uh, look. Uh, why didn't they build anything for 50 years? Well, initially they had two working breweries. Uh, the yep. government were continuing to hammer brewers with tax yep. uh, at the end of the 19th century. At the start of the 20th century, the government was on record as saying that the working man was predisposed to being a drunk. That wasn't a good thing. Unbelievable. First World War came along. Uh, the munitions minister, who I think was Lloyd George at the time, yep. is on record as saying the government are fighting the Germans, the Austrians and beer drinkers. Yeah. And so the government added a further tax, a wealth tax, on top of standard tax for all brewers. So breweries were under great threat. Massive threat, yeah. yeah. End of the, uh, uh, after the First World War in the, in the 1920s, no business confidence, but eventually the two breweries were showing signs of, of wear and tear considerably. Yeah. They decided to build a new brewery in the 1930s, Fantastic. and this is the building. And just while we're here, this is this is one of the original vessels. Yeah, the yeah, old mash mash yeah, 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 yeah. We just kept that uh, very well polished. It's got the green in the. You'll we'll see some lovely uh, copper mash tuns when we go inside. Uh, but this is, is one of the, an, an older original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're keeping that history. Together. Yeah, and people ask what it is, and we've got something yeah. to talk about. Yeah. Okay, let's okay, move let's on. Let's go inside. And a, Marble and a grind entrance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You want to go left and I'll go right and I'll meet you at the top. Okay. Wow. So loads of light coming into the brewery, lots of natural light for the brewers to get their work done. going on a daily basis is there a lot of maintenance or, or is it generally it's built to last well we mash three times a day six days a week and we use the sunday for maintenance yeah. typically um, not very many people run this facility we're on five floors here generally about three guys run the, the, the mashing and the, uh, the and the hopping process okay so not very uh, people intensive yeah. when the building was put up in the 30s um, Marble, as you've already observed. Marble on the floor. Marble on the wall. What's that all about? Well, it's about it's continuity about and, yeah. Yeah. and brightness. Yeah. The windows are three times the size they need to be because they're quite a lot more workers than the third. And these are actually cutting edge aluminium from windows. Yeah. Like the windows the windows the they have brittle to They didn't just put small wooden frame windows that would have rotted. They put in aluminium frame windows and the last 80 years on, still it's going strong. still there today, it's still there today. This is so impressive, so impressive. I think so, the mash Beautiful tons. floors, beautiful windows, fantastic mash tubs. Everything, so, so, everything, everything you used to put was here. This is, this is built, up. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. And you have something which is reasonably newer either side. If yeah, you look to our right. Ross can explain the unit uh, over here. This is a result of the change in drinking habits that we referred to earlier, the need to make different beers yeah. uh, rather than the same number. I think, as I understand it, uh, the turn of the century, uh, year 2000, we were making about 30 beers. Today we make in excess of 90 beers. Wow. And that's a proliferate, that's the drinking expectation. Yeah. Drinkers want a wider range of beers. And part of that is, is, is the, um, what do we call this, the Heritage Brewery? No, the uh, Edmunds Brewery. Edmunds Brewery, all sorts of different terms. I call it our, our, um, our development brewery. And, and Ross can talk more about it. Hey, Ross. 
Yeah, so uh, the lovely St. Edmund's Rural since 2013. Uh, it was built to kind of uh, add a sort of spark of um, innovation into the, the process. We've also got a large brewery. There's limitations in terms of doing trials and having wastage and having that kind of creative license to uh, create new beers without having to make sure we don't waste loads of beers. St. Edmund's Brew House in, minimum 15 barrel over and maximum 30. So, so this is your toy. You get, toy. To, you get to go, right, okay, what style do I want to brew today? Yeah, you have a chat with your fellow your fellow colleagues and you go, well, let's do a, a, a stout or yeah. a porter or something like that. So this is what this is. Yeah. Should we have a look, we have a look around it? It's a pretty fancy toy. Yeah. Absolutely. Toy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. 11 of women from Moscow we've got. So we've got a very slight different setup to the main brewery, mainly because we were very limited on space. We've actually got a mash conversion allowed to turn Copper Whirlpool set up compared to our mash turn okay. Copper Whirlpool set up in the main brew house. But Have a look through the windows with the camera. What, what, what sort of style is that? It's a sort of light refreshing golden ale. Yeah. American Ops Amarillo is the main player in that one, so uh, there's no bad beers with Amarillo in it. High five. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, lovely, so this is this is your, your... And a lot of the regional breweries are doing this, isn't it? Yeah. We're in a small area. Did you have to cut out a match to get this So we, we used to have a fourth copper in, in this area. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we sacrificed a copper to, to yeah. give us the flexibility. That, that so, happens. Yeah, it's I been brilliant. That. So yeah, back in bed kit. And we'll see how uh, the, basically the fermentation area for this later on is, again, a, on a much smaller scale to our main, our main fermentation. Introduction to the brewery. Why are we here? Why are we at the top? So the best place to start on the brewery is at the start. Yeah. And, uh, that for us is on the roof because we are a traditional gravity fed brewery which means we start with our main raw ingredient on the roof which is our water so our water is all naturally sourced under the ground so okay. it's all uh, all well water all the brewing liquor that we use liquor yep. is a brewing term for water yeah very confusing for some of the americans but not for us sorry <laughs> english and welsh <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we start start by um basically taking the water from under the ground. We've got four wells around the brewery. Okay. We run three at any one time and leave one on rest and rotate them around to make sure that we give them all a fair chance to rest and basically if you run them for too long, you stop bringing too much crap through. Yep. Um, we look around actually, we look around Berry. We've got some absolutely wonderful Beautiful. views today. Great day for it. Really warm as well up here. It's so lovely, it's really, really lovely. Stay. Yeah. We're in the heart of Suffolk. Yeah, it was a cracking area for growing the malted barley that we use and uh, actually we're very lucky to have our, our local maltings just over the tree line there. Not the huge bit on the left, that's actually British sugar which makes uh, your silver spoon sugar. Really? So the, okay. bit, so the bit on the right hand side is what we're is interested in, which is the malting, so that's okay. bald malt, which give us all of our pale malt, all of our crystal yeah. malt and all of our amber malt. And so. you can smell them all. Uh, you guys haven't got smell of vision, so we're going to have to explain <laughs> it. I've just got a wonderful aroma here of brewing. I don't know if you can just see over the wall here. You can see that's the boil. That's, yeah, the, steam the, boil, that's yeah. the steam coming off the boil. And it just smells absolutely terrific. Yeah. And that, that's your little bit of smell of vision that we can. <laughs> we, 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 you, you know, we, we have to give you. Um, so the next stage is, is, I suppose, milling, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And we can just about hear that in the background. Probably not picking up on the microphone. Yeah. We can, we can hear the malt being blown over at the moment. Our silos for the bulk malt around the back of this building here. And uh, we, we blow that over to our screens, which we can hear shaking in the background at the moment, making sure we only get the malt through at the next stage. It's important that we only want to add um, malt to our process. We don't hear the bits that might end up in there. Any stones, nuts or bolts have come loose in the lorry. Yeah. So uh, we can hear the screen shaking downstairs, which we'll uh, see in the next stage. Uh, we can have a quick sort of a panoramic view around the, yeah, around the roof as well. We can see the other yeah. side of the brewery, which was the original King Brewery, part yep, of the Green that's, King. That's walked back. The breweries, uh, the Green Brewery, the King Brewery that came together. Yep. Um, so we can see that across the other side of the road and we can look down to the south where we've got our uh, distribution and also our packaging lines as well for cask and keg. Fantastic, okay, so here we go. So is this um, is this tower part of your brewery? So this is the that's the, the chimneys from the boiler house. Okay. So steam being fairly imperative for any brewery um, of any size, so uh, you can use so much electricity. Just takes it away into the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. So we need steam to boil with. So we had we basically put steam into the boil. Yeah. And then obviously the words coming out, and you can see that we saw the uh, evaporation coming off there earlier. 
there's literally a main road that separates the two sites that would have been the Green King, I'm sorry, the Green and the King Brewery. Right, okay. Obviously, we've been one business now for way over 100 years, probably near 150 now that it's been Green King, not just Green and King. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the, the one remaining pipe that lasts over the road, and that actually came yeah, from around the. That. That, that one pipe is completely redundant. It actually came from the vaulting. Brewery that was on the other side of the brewery, and that was actually where the malt used to get blown over oh, directly right, from the malting. Oh, right, I see, I see. So it's um, do you want a wasp on you there? <laughs> no, it likes a beer. <laughs> it's good to be there. Got high biz on. <laughs> Follow the high biz. <laughs> you can't. No. Yeah. Cut that bit out. <laughs> I've got it. I've got everything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's no actual brewing over there anymore. It's fermentation, which is obviously part of the brewing process. But from the hot side, there's not a brew house there anymore. In 1938, we built the combined brew house, which we're standing on the roof of now. Yeah, it's still fairly old, but actually in the history of Green King, fairly new. <laughs> Absolutely, and and it's great that you still have this, um, this this mix of old and new, and it's all together. It's kind of it's just kind of bolted on, isn't it? And yeah. and, and w but works. Yeah, organic works well. organic growth over centuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you look over this wall down here, we can look further down the hill. We can see down to some of the rest of our production site. Oh wow, look at that. So we've got our distribution centre there, so that's full of kegs, casks, cans, bottles. Right. That's all ready to be distributed out to our customers. So right that's here. all your packaging over there, that's where everything is packaged. The packaging's yeah? a bit right down the bottom. Okay, and yeah. a bit in the middle is where it all goes after it's packaged, before it goes off in the lorries you see there. To our, see. Either straight to our customers or to our distribution centres around the country. Wow. Wow. What you can see though is that big pipe bridge going down. Yeah, yeah, and what's that, that? That's our transfer pipe from the brewery. So that's our beer going directly down right. to the packaging lines. And those lines hold about 5,000 pints each. It's, really? Yeah, it's quite a bit of beer in there. It'd be a good session in the one pipe line. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then um, down the front here, we've got the Theatre Royal, which uh, was, was built by the, the Green family and given yeah. to the, the people of the town. And we rent that back to the company for one, one pound a year, and like a thousand year lease. So don't call me on the amount of years, but it's a long, long time. And and there's, there's room for a garden party. Yeah, so that's Look the, at that, that's that a nice? theatre's garden party, so they, they often have uh, drinks out there after the shows. We've got our engineer stores down on that kind of a um, green top on it. It's so our engineer stores where all that guys are just running where they all work on it. The clever ones are in there. <laughs> Us brewers, we just, just make the beer. And number six down there, which was uh, built by the green family. Family home. They actually don't know where we started our here. We're have boots from over 100 years ago in there, and we'll actually have a, a visit into there later on to have a look at some of the some of the things we have in there. There's an absolute fountain of, of history information, and, uh, yeah, information and just there. a dig through. It's it's brilliant. Brilliant. We're currently going through that information. Yeah, we are. It's, uh, we've actually employed an archivist now to start going through. We've got so much stuff that we just have, but nobody's had time to go through. There's yeah. hundreds and hundreds of books and some absolute, you know, brilliant from handwritten diaries to the director's minutes from the 1930s. And so important, yeah. so important to, to, to go through and you know it just helps with the, with the history going forward but it's a beautiful day, a summer's day 2018 July, um, it, it's a real pleasure to be, to be here, let's let's get inside, sure. should we have a walk around or? or we go yeah? back around this way, we've got to go Okay, let's, let's get back inside but yeah. We couldn't have picked a better day no. for this brewery tour. But being a gravity fed brewery, we've got our wells dotted around the brewery. Okay. And so the first part of a gravity fed brewery is the first ingredient, which mm. is water. The water. So we're all lucky to have our naturally sourced water from the ground. Uh, in a more modern brewery, in a, in a city centre, you might be limited um, to not being able to drill your own wells and having to use the town's water, which is, has been treated and, and purified, uh, often chlorinated as well. So is that the, um, what they call? It would have to go through the whole Burtonisation process. Uh, if you, if is you that, were making is that right? a, a, a beer that was suitable for that style, yeah, Burtonisation yeah. would just be the getting the mineral content right. Yeah, but you don't have to do that here. Because no, you, we, we've you, got a fantastic water. water source. We yeah. can, for a lot of our beers that don't suit the natural sort of water source, actually strip all the minerals out and then build them back up with the right yeah. sort of content. Um, so if we're brewing a stout or a pale ale or something in between, we can actually get the balance right to make Perfect. sure the beer's spot on. So we're down on the malting level, yeah? Yeah, so we've got the... This is where we first see malt. So we've uh, got our delivery to our bulk malt into the silos on the back. And what this floor is basically a system that brings the malt over from the silos and through our screens. And the screens are just there to take out any bits that shouldn't be in, in there, any stones that might have got loose in the process, any bits of bolts or any bits of sort of uh, 
organic material, they shouldn't be there. They just let the malt drop through. That's really important. So if you want to still have a beer. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, beer can be dangerous. It creates a spark in the process. When we've milled it, there's a dusty atmosphere. It can get a great explosion. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the chances are very slim, um, but the impact could be huge. So uh, we take uh, all precautions necessary. And what you can see within in the room there as well is any of our speciality malt. So in bulk we have our uh, English pale malt. Then we have our crystal malt and our amber malt. And then anything else, any oats, any wheat, any character special tank freezing so you want in front of us. Yeah. Any larger malt, we'll bring like 25 kilo sacks. Actually, this can be a real manual process. Um, so there's a lift in the corner over there. I see. And our pallet's done quite fit there because of the overhang of the bags. Right. So every time they bring a pallet up, the guys have to unload every bag into the lift. Yeah. They can't get in the lift, they have to go up the stairs. Right, okay. And then meet the lift at the top and re palletize every bag. Right, but get it all back on the floor. And then when it comes to brew day, they have to un palletize it again and add every bag in. Yeah. Which sometimes is only four or five bags. But for stuff like our Noble, which is our lager, and these are lager malt, that can be eight tons at a time. I think we've got a triple hand that's so 24 you, tons. You, you hand put the bags of malt in? Yeah, so yeah, but you can just see that sort of bin lid there. Oh, right, yeah, and yeah. Put the hydrant lid there and have to add and then you add in. in. So, yeah. so real hands-on real hands brewery, on. yeah. And some of the guys don't like it, but some of the guys get to miss the gym afterwards, so it can be six Yeah, It can actually course, be a benefit yeah. for some You don't of them. need to go to the gym if you work in a brewery. Yeah, like we have some incredibly yeah. strong guys around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, much stronger than me. <laughs> the most weight yeah. I lift is... Um... <laughs> Half a kilo of yeah. <laughs> So from here, literally the next floor down again, gravity fed, we start with the water on the top, we now that is our malt, our second material, and the next phase basically going through the screens so they can hit the mill, and we know we've only got malt the barley there, and we've got our two mills below us, which we can head down the stairs and have a look at. Down to the next level. So this is our mill floor, so you can see on the left and the right, two identical mills, traditional four roll mills, and uh, this is where the, the malt of barley drops in. The mills are spinning round and there's set a very tight gap. The malt drops in and crushes it open. Very simple process, but very important to get the, the gap set right. If it's too wide, we'll not break it down enough. And if it's too narrow, we'll break it into too fine a grist. Okay. Which means when we mash in, we'll not be able to separate the work from the, the grist properly. Um, and if we do it too coarse, then we're not going to have extract and we're wasting that money and not making the beer strength that we're looking for. So um, from there, the, the malt is dropping down the next level, which is probably the hottest bit in the brewery. It's around about 45 degrees down there and 100% humidity, so you might see myself and Simon get a little bit sweaty in the next bit. Let's so we might in. try and make it a little bit quicker than we would normally do on a winter's day. Okay, let's get in there. on the old speckled in yeah the car from the MG factory uh, which the name give uh, the old speckled in it's a famous name um, and so that was a, a celebration of 50 years of the MG car factory and uh, still a, a really strong a really beer. good beer really for you guys beer. yeah yeah uh, best selling premium ale bottle yeah. so normally loyal following and uh, actually it's got its uh, cousins in our old golden hen or crafty hen or coffee hen but also the gluten-free version of Old Speckled Hen now, which has gone very well. If you have a look in my fridge, uh, I think I've mentioned this on social media today, if I'm not drinking craft beer, um, if I have woken up on a Sunday, last minute type of thing, my wife wants to have a barbecue, I don't want to jump in the shop and drive 10 miles to a craft beer store, what you'll generally find in my fridge is either Old Speckled Hen or Old Hoppy Hen. Yeah, brilliant. Oh no, sorry, old golden end, should yeah. I say? Which is a golden end, which is a tiny, tiny We speak about golden end, actually we've got some examples of hops here. And a galaxy here, from all the way from Tasmania or Victoria, South Australia. Yeah. Uh, we were quite an early adopter of galaxy when it first became a quite a popular variety. Yeah. And uh, we're actually good mates with a farmer. We've had him over all the way from Tasmania. Really? To have a look around the brewery. And uh, he, was, he was amazed by it, uh, as everyone it's is terrific. when they come around. And, uh, he was more amazed actually the breweries older than his country, which he thought was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see some of the raw materials here. 
We've some got our, crystal malt there. Our pale malt, the Pinot, from all the way a mile away. <laughs> yeah. And it's just good to have a look there at what comes out of, out of the mill. So this is the grist, which you can see there. Is, you see the, the white starch endosperm there, and the, the husk which has been left fairly intact, which is very important for an infusion mash tun to allow the wort to separate from the solids when we're running off the sponge. Absolutely, some yeah. Bramley Cross, traditional English British, British, yeah, absolutely. The Cascade there as well. Oh, we've got a Cascade on that one, I think. All the way from the US of A. Brilliant, the, uh, the, the, of the Godfather hop of the US craft scene. And here's some of the selection of our beers, yeah. Right, eh? Hen's Tooth. Yeah. I love that beer. Now, Hen's Tooth, again, is one of the first beers I reviewed on the channel. Um, you, if you have a look back eight over eight years on the channel, you'll find a bottle of Hen's Tooth. I'm probably two stone lighter uh, reviewing this beer. But the first ever beer, that, this is I iconic really, to stand next to the. Perhaps we should go over to, to, to stand next to the old speckled hen car. The first ever beer review we recorded in the kitchen was a, a bottle of Old Speckled Hen eight years ago. And yeah, I still drink it today. It's still a really decent beer. Yeah. Really decent beer. So that's a bit of history in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a, in the mill as well. We've got down the, uh, our grist cases. Yeah. This is the mill of mold ready to go into the mash tuns. Fantastic bit of metal work. Yeah, so yeah. Don't make them like that anymore. Absolutely not. And the reason it's so hot here is these four stainless steel tanks at the back for our hot liquor tanks. Right. So the water sitting in there at 80 degrees Celsius, um, which is really warm. Yeah, you can. You and can, it's really humid. You can feel it. You can feel it. So there's your hot liquor tanks. That's the water, and you store that water at a, a temperature. Yeah. Just come from the, the roof tanks at ambient temperature, whatever the ground water's coming out at. More than it goes through heat exchange and heat it up. Yeah. And it's been stored in there at 80. We're looking for a temperature in the mash of around about 65. Yeah. Yeah. It can be as low as 63 or as high as 68. Yeah. Depending on the beer type. So on the way to the mash tin, we had a bit of cold water, depending on the temperature set point, to get exactly the right temperature for the malt. Cool. So the enzymes can do the job. Again, gravity fed, so down under the level we go. Yeah. Look at the view across there, isn't it? Yeah, look at that. Another fantastic 1930s stained glass window. Uh, well, not stained glass window, but a 1930s style window, should I say. And the other coffers, look at these beautiful, beautiful coffers. Look at this. So, so how old are these? It's a great view across here. So we've got the three mashtons here, which are actually replicas of the originals, but it was uh, very important for us as a business to make sure we put in the same styles as it was there. So. It would be a lot cheaper to put stainless steel back in, um, but would it have looked as, as impressive as that? And, and it would have not. resonated with, with who, the, who we are as a brewery. Exactly, exactly. So you've got mash tuns one, two, and three. And the beauty of these mash tuns are we can use them separately, so we can have three different brews going through at the same time, or we can use them all together to make one big batch. Really? Or we could even have a two and a one. So the, the guys in the brewery house love it when they come in and they've got one big brew because it's easy to manage. When they've got yeah. three brews going through separately, that is one hard job for one person from malt intake through the mills. Running three brews through the brew house, kettles, whirlpools, and off to fermentation. That's all one guy doing that, and it's it's a very manually hands-on job to do all that. So your bigger volume beers, like your Green King IPA, your Old Speck yeah. Ten, that could take up three, or, yeah. three, three so mash tuns. The cycle time about nine, ten yeah. hours for those ones. What we can do, we can go and dive in and have a look in the mash tuns. Yeah, let's have a look. Speckled in here at the moment. Oh, look at that! Get the camera in here! That's all speckled hen on a grand scale. Look at that. Picturesque. So, what's happened? We've already mashed in. Yeah. Got the thick porridge like consistency that we're looking for. Yeah. We let it sit there for an hour while the enzymes do their job breaking down the starches into those sugars. Wow. Obviously, that, the sugary liquid wort that we're looking to produce, which is the, the meal for the yeast. As brewers, all we do is make a dinner for the yeast, and the yeast does all the hard work. And what we're doing now is sparging, which is the application of hot water on top to rinse all the sugars through, and make sure we take all the goodness from the malt with us into the next stage, which is the boil and the kettle. 
That is absolutely, that is a wonderful picture. I'm not sure the camera's picking up just how... Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we started at the bottom, we went to the top, we're back down to the bottom again. Is there anything else you want to Basically, the, the next stage we'll have a look at is the, uh, the kettles, and then we'll anecdotally discuss the rest of the tour since it's uh, not that accessible from, from here. Okay, sure. <laughs> Alright, so um, from the, the mash tons, the wort's running off and we're sparging as we've just seen. So yep. Currently, through those pipes down there, the wort's running through to our kettles. I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, in the kettles, we're going to use boiler. It's a bit like a kettle in the kitchen, but yeah. a little bit bigger. Slightly different technology. So we use a thermo siphon, uh, external work boiler, which basically boils it with the application of steam. So the boiler house earlier. Yeah. Uh, we boil for an hour. There's a few reasons we do that. One, sterilization. If you boil anything for an hour, it ain't gonna be alive. Yeah. So any, any bacteria that might be in there, it's gonna spoil the beer. Completely gone. Uh, probably within a few minutes. Small beer for children, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next bit, uh, we're gonna add hops to it. So well, that's where we start with our yep. third ingredient, hops. We use hops for bitterness, yep. the flavour, the aroma, and also to any microbial properties as well. So we add them at the start of the boil, and that takes the alpha acids, isomerizes through the application of heat, which makes it sort of flavour active within your mouth. The bitterness becomes more perceptive. That's where you get your lovely crisp bit of finish from. The later you add them in the process, the more flavour and aroma you get, because you're not boiling for long, as long. It retains some of the, the oil character. And then we've got the whirlpools downstairs where we can add a lot more hops again to bring more flavour and aroma. Okay, so we're in the sample, uh, Green King. Look at these vaulted ceilings. Yeah. Wonderful. So historically, we just come down here every morning and taste all the beer that we packaged the day before. Yeah. Unfortunately, because of the age of the building, we're starting to get damp in here and start to sort of impact on the ability for us to smell and taste beer. So we moved the facility to do that now, but we've kept the room because it's still fantastic. We're actually underneath the brewery now, we're below ground level. Yeah, yeah. And you can feel the temperature nice and cool. Nice and cool, yeah. 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 Um, Which is why it was a great place to keep the beer, but now it's not damp. Of it's course. perfect for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah, we used to access that when we very, very rarely get the fire mix out of its bats into a perk and this is where we do the kind of slow conditioning of it. Right, um, okay. Should we have a wander in to the... Yeah, this So these bottles here were brewed um, for the coronation of Edward, um, who abdicated before he uh, had his coronation and ended up marrying Wallace Simpson. We brewed these uh, back in 1950-odd, um, and um, they were rediscovered a number of years, years ago when we were doing some building work, and uh, they're stored here now. Um, probably not very drinkable, but uh, a, great, uh, a great story for us. Okay, last one. Absolutely, yes, here we are in our West Plantation block and it's a real mixed match of vessels here. We've got um, some of our traditional open square fermenters which aren't quite open anymore because we've actually retrofitted stainless steel lids on to control the CO2 in the atmosphere wow. and also make them more hygienic. So these would have finished here, they would have been, they would have been open, have been, all full of beer, you could see it all kind of foaming up and... and most of the time it's been on the floor as well. On the floor so. and, and fantastic, but of course um, you, you, you put a lid over the top now yeah, so the, the man way to add any dry hops to it, and also check the, the beer. Um, it's quite hard to see from the little side glass sometimes. So yeah, um, as we walk down, we get to the uh, kind of the, the, the jewel in our crown, which is our fire mix bats, uh, which are, are very proud of, and they're real part of our history and heritage. Oh, so here we are, Simon. So these are your five. X vats. Yeah, so let me explain about 5X. 5X is a, a beer that we brew at 12, 30%, normally comes out somewhere around about 12 and a half. Yeah. We ferment it in our normal fermenters and then we transfer it into our 5X vats where we age it for two years minimum. Sometimes a bit longer, depends on how the production schedule's got, but two years minimum, they're spending a year to age and take the flavours and characters from the oak 
and it's a very slow process and it's uh, you can see at the top we've got the kind of rubble that helps it breathe um, it's a natural sort of vent so it, it'll obviously expand during the summer with the heat and then it'll contract in the winter so we let, let, to, to sort of, um, let that breathe naturally over the time and then after two years we take it out of there and we blend it we don't sell this by itself we don't even do sort of uh, bottles for ourselves apart from sometimes and you're going to be looking at this Simon we've got one bottle for you to try I'm going to get to try five minutes, really? Which is really rare. You've, you've already seen people today who've, uh, who've been here for 30 odd years and never tried it. Never so, tried so. the beer. I'm really excited by this. Really excited. Um, should we go and try some now? We should go and try some. <laughs> or should we carry on with the Let's just go. Wonderful. So what, when did these when did these bats become operational? So these are around about 15 years old. We have okay. two two more bats through that wall, uh, yeah. which are quite hard to get to. They're sort of not accessible without it. So uh, very short people actually need to be alright for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get through. We'll get through. Um, one of, the, we'll one get through. of those bats through there is over 60 years old, and one of them's about three years old. So we've got a mix of different okay. bats, and we're in the future looking to maybe expand how many bats we've got because it's, it's a cracking part of our history. So, um, just a, a quick question on these bats. Um, was it a, a, a reason in your, can you find it through the history books, the reason why the brewery purchased these bats went into that direction of brewing this style? No, you said the, the exact decision, but it was quite common for 100 years ago to have this kind of bat in a brewery and it's become less and less common as yeah. beers became more and more drink. 12% barrel aged beers have become a, this sort of a popular thing again. Yeah. But for yeah. a long, long time they weren't because of either the strength, the price, the, the intensity of the flavour. Yeah. So very lucky that we've still got them actually. Um, so, you, know, you can't buy that history of having a 60 year old wooden bat. Absolutely. So it's great to have that. So, how flexible are these are these bats? Say um, everybody in the world wanted to drink Russian Imperial Stout. Could you barrel age Russian Imperial Stout in this bat? I suppose we could, but then there wouldn't be our 5X bats. Yeah. So, uh, I, I couldn't see us ever changing the use of those bats because yeah. they've got such a long time in the beer style. So. Be 5x bats will always be the 5x bats. In the future, who knows, we might expand out and have different types of sizes and woods yeah. and different agings, but for now, those bats will always be 5x. Very special. Thanks for showing me the opportunity, uh, or just showing me the barrels. Yeah, it's great. Great big barrels. <laughs> so, how many pints is in one? Uh, so, 100 barrels, brewers' barrels, 163 litres in a barrel. Uh, how many? 20. 28,000 pints of barrel aged beer. Lucky boy, lucky boy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in. Put your comments in the comments box. Subscribe to our daily beer reviews. Check out Green King. Stone the Crows. <laughs> and cheers.